The Fiat Tipo is today in our full review on Autogefühl, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars today with me, with Thomas. This car is also sold under the name Fiat Agia or also Dodge Neon. So we'll explain you every detail on exterior, interior and the driving. Today is the hatch version. It's available as a sedan, as a hatch and as an estate. All have the main things in common. So this review will also count for the other ones, but just a special for the hatch here today. And join us here now in full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go. So the Fiat Tipo and also the name sibling, the Agia, is built in Turkey and they are also in Turkey and the region is sold as Agia. Rest of Europe then the Tipo and for the Dodge Neon, that one is built in Mexico. The interesting thing about this vehicle is it starts at about 15,000 euros and even if you go for the higher trim specs as here today we have the S design for you or well, we could also say the Fiat Tipo S. That sounds sexy, doesn't it? Well, that one here even just only reaches 21,000 euros with some extras and stuff, so still remains quite low in the price. What do we really get from it? Well, the S design comes with shiny black elements, so also in the front grille, which is basically pretty modernly designed and it's not too much screaming out, but it shows a modern compact car or modern compact hatch in this case then also with those widely drawn headlights for example and you can see the hood here is separated it's not this small lip, even a very big lip so you can replace this part here in small crashes and uh, well when you just have the small lip it sometimes looks a little bit strange this way it is done here that is for example something we've also seen with the um, E-Class AMG or something like that. Well, not sure if you want to compare them, but I think the front is basically well done in the design. What do you think? And by the way, we discussed that recently with the DS7. What about the small gaps or German Spaltmaße as we say here in Germany? Well, in the front hood that looks quite good, doesn't it? What do you think? 4 meters 36 or 14 foot 3 is total length and the hatch version is the shortest one. The sedan would be 10 centimeters longer and the estate 20 centimeters longer. Interestingly, the price is the lowest with sedan being 1000 euros cheaper than this one. This one is in the middle and the estate is 1000 euros more expensive. Of course, all three versions uh, can be compared. We also had a, a review of the sedan earlier. But pretty interesting, I will show you some parts which have been updated and actually this one makes a better impression now. I'm not sure if it's about the hatch or if they just, you know, renewed some parts. Here in the S design you also get black pack again, 17 inch rims. Optionally you can also get 18 inch, but I wouldn't uh, recommend the 18 one for the riding comfort, just stay with those then. And I mean, wow, especially here in the metropolitan grey color, then also with the black window frames. They are not glossy, um, they are matte black. This is, I would say, a little low quality wise from the, from the frames here. But you know, then you get the glossy mirror caps here. Overall, I think, wow, what a great design. I mean, it's not super special, but I think it looks really sporty, almost a little bit aggressive. What do you think? Interesting is also that the door handles here are basically split in two, let's say it. When you open them, you first have to press in the inner part and then you open the outer one. Not sure why they've done it that way. It looks to me a little bit complicated. And a typical hatch ending here now with a big C-pillar. Yeah, it looks a little bit golf-like, doesn't it? And in the rear, well, I see a little bit Alfa Giulietta, you know, here with the taillights. Also wide, very modern look. But however, you know, a lot of compact cars look similar, so I think that's not too bad. Overall, I think, also with the rear, everything looks really harmonic in the design and they're not fooling around too much. Everything looks to fit to each other, so 
I think, especially in the hatch, it looks really quite nice. The sedan looks uh, more conservative, you know, more, more classic. And for Heartland Europe, they also aim to sell the hatch more often, definitely. Which version would you actually go for? Hatch, sedan or the estate? So talking about the engines, this one, the 1.6 liter, naturally aspirated so-called e-torque engine. You see here also four cylinders in this cover. Actually nicely done for a standard engine cover. 110 horsepower and this one can also be combined with the automatic gearbox. Then there's also 1.4 liter naturally aspirated engine, 95 horsepower or a 1.4 liter with turbo, 120. And diesels 1.3, 95 horsepower and 1.6, 120. That one optional with the DCT. So when we get inside, we see where they do use a lot of hard plastics, but for example, they have also a structure at the inside of the door. So um, definitely not the most premium solution, but they try to spice it up with easy methods, and I appreciate that. Then the cockpit right here. The steering wheel is pretty thick. That, you know, it's the whole FCA corporation, Maserati, Fiat, Jeep, they all have those very thick, <laughs> sick, <laughs> no, in this case, thick steering wheels. The instruments, classic analog left and right, in the middle a small digital speedometer. And you also see those structured dashboards here, for example, see the structure in there. This part is also soft, by the way. And then when we take a look at the seats, base seats would be just pure fabric and I think I would rather go for the base seats even because here this uh, well, those ones are the S design seats they look better they have a good mix also of uh, fabric on the inside and leatherette on the outside part or the front part so sustainable solutions and the only thing you know the fabric they use on the inside here um, is a little bit slicker than the base fabric and you know it really depends on what you like but overall I think it's a consistent design they found here for this vehicle. And let's get inside, standard compact hatch. You can check out the steering wheel here. It is very well adjustable in all ways. The seat has an electric lumbar support. I usually don't use those, but others do. It goes quite easy just in the front and you can pump it up you all right here. It's a little hard to do and sometimes feels a little clumsy. Back part like this, um, there's no turning knob, there's a lever and then standard for front and back end. Well, I'm one with 86 or 6 foot 1 and still gives me some headroom. So it's also very well usable for taller people, that's absolutely no problem. So I like the approach of the seats with the fabric leatherette mix. But, uh, you know, the base seats will also just do fine. What I tend to criticize is that the seats are itself, they are a little bit too stiff. So they should have a softer core and that would be more comfortable, especially for long-term riding. So um, not my comfort favorite, I have to say. Now to the interior overview, which basically has a round design. Here again, you can see the structures they've picked again to give it a little bit more structure. Okay, that one was easy now. Um, this one is also a little bit softened up. And one thing that is very important, the previous sedan we've tested had a very mm, hazardous smell, you know, like those new materials and uh, emissions coming from them. That's not the case with this vehicle. So again, either it's the hatch or it's really that this car here, a little bit later in the production cycle, has been um, you know, improved. Screen either 5 inch or when you have the lounge or S design version, you get the 7 inch screen. You see that Apple CarPlay is also integrated, but you see the 
or in here the integration is not that well done it's not over the full screen however you can say you still have the controls on the lower part then from it soon we'll also take a detailed look at that the steering wheel again so thick so i'm not exactly sure also with the big plastic buttons here that doesn't appear so much premium if they would change the steering wheel they could easily spice up the um, uh, the general quality impression of this vehicle but again it's not really um, badly done or something like that considering the price you can be satisfied normal glove box well is it falls down and it's pretty small the climate unit is still separated for the temperature and also for the vents seat heating is very down below right there and then you also have the place to store your phone or to plug it in with USB some more space and then the shifting lever here again this is very well done because you can just pull it back to reverse and then you just from P to R you have to put the button if you put it down then to N and D you can just pull it back like this this works quite well and also with the R reverse the rear view camera appears which has a pretty weird resolution but again it's still good to have a rear view camera of course and i like a classic handbrake somehow you know I, you know i'm not against technology but to have a classic manual handbrake just for emergency cases always feels a little bit better am i alone on this or what do you think and we have two cup holders which are adaptive yeah, have rubber pads on the inside and then this armrest here um, also with a nice little red cover could be a little more fixedly attached and you get some more storage space beneath that and by the way the inside of the doors uh, doesn't fit that well for bigger bottles and one more look to the instruments through the driver's perspective I always like that view somehow and some more details to the infotainment system here again when you are in the carplay mode for example you can go to the main menu always like this or then change to your music yeah way to go and on the lower part you can then go to the radio or for example also to the gps um, you can scroll in it like with a smartphone that works quite, quite well um, so I'm overall satisfied and it's easy to use. Entering address sometimes takes too long somehow from, uh, from the time. And you can check the trip, for example, also the consumption you had. There we are, 7.2, telling you more about it when we drive the car. And you still have the possibility to have the volume knob, but I usually just do it at the steering wheel, just behind the steering wheel, there's, um, there's a button where I go, um, lower or higher in the volume and also you can hear when you drive the vehicle you can um, zoom in and out um, actually no sorry misinformation well it's for tuning what I want to say it would be cool if you could <laughs> zoom in and out you can do it like this but then I think just doing it uh, with a uh, with a pinch is actually better so that's about it for my infotainment system and you can always turn it off. Maybe a good feature at night. And watch out for this city button. What about it? I will tell you in the driving part. And not to forget one thing we also should mention. The Euro NCAP crash test results were not the best. Uh, three stars from five uh, without the safety package and four with the safety package. You know, they nowadays split the test results always with or without any assistant packages you have. And also the uh, autonomous emergency brake is not from standard equipment. You get it then with higher trim levels. So how does the vehicle perform here in the rear? Well, there's not too much uh, knee room left. When I really push it, I do hit the seat in front of me. So not for the tallest people, but still quite okay. You can drive with four adults. A fifth seat is also available. Headroom wise, that is no problem. I can even still put a hand over my head. You all can only flip the seats from here. No possibility to do it via the trunk. Um, and we'll soon also take a look from the rear how those 440 liters will look like. One thing more you can do from here is have this middle armrest which also has the cup holder which comes out 
very slowly, so... There it is. <laughs> but pretty funny, isn't it? So let's open the hatch. Here we go. And there is no floor bottom here, so it goes deeper in here. Um, well, you get a little bit more space, but you don't have the flexibility of loading things through easily. And you see it's a two-third, one-third split. And even if you put the seats down there, they don't go that flat. Well, if you demount the head restraints, then it would be a little bit flatter, but the step will remain and also it goes basically upwards. But in general, it's a well usable hatch trunk and definitely you know, standard in size. You can't complain. If you want more, go for the estate. Yo, what's so up? You're joining me in the hood for the driving part. And I'm turning up my 1.6 liter engine. So, it easily goes to 4,000 RPM and, well, it sounds a little bit exhausted, but the sound isn't too bad actually. And the thing is that this naturally aspirated engine without the turbo, you have to kick it a little bit more to get the power to the ground you really want it. Uh, it's not a racing engine for sure. You know, there's also a smaller petrol engine and uh, so this one here is then surely the better choice. And I mean, why not? Putting one or 10 horsepower from 1.6 liter of displacement, not always like 0 0.9 liters with 200 horsepower, which is kind of crazy. So why not? And here combined with the automatic gearbox, con converter gearbox, that is somewhat, in some situations, a little bit lazy. Mm, but when you take it a little bit slower, it's perfectly fine then. So here on the motorway you hear that I have to turn up my voice a little bit, so the sound insulation is surely not the best. Mm, it's not catastrophic or something, um, but it's nothing that would be standing out here. I have the steering set to the so-called city mode because, well, it is a little bit softer to steer, um, but it feels a little bit artificial anyway. Turn it off and well, in the small angles doesn't make such a big difference. But when you're turning it around here in the city, when searching by parking space and something, then you do feel a difference that in the city mode it is easier to steer. And since the steering does not have a very natural feeling anyway, you can just as well leave it in the city mode and then at least have, you know easier steering, but that's totally up to your preference. So we're getting off the first short motorway part to some city driving and well the overview is basically exactly as in most of the compact segment hatches. Um, pretty thick B pillars, but you can get along with it, that's actually okay. Um, you've maybe now realized the turning indicators, you can really click them in or I can just tap them and then they just flash three times. That's, you know, very common in uh, most of the new automotives nowadays. However, sometimes I feel that the tap doesn't work that good. You have to tap it a little bit harder then, then you're almost in that region that it clicks in. So that's what just happened now. Yeah, other than that, Mm, the overview is pretty standard, I would say. Um, also, the driving feeling of this car is uh, not set in a specific direction. So, it tries to appeal to as many people as possible. However, suspension-wise, when I'm driving slowly now and I'm feeling those small bumps in the road, maybe, maybe top from sewage systems, some potholes, and that's where the suspension is not performing that well. When you drive a little bit faster and those waves, um, that is actually what the suspension is handling quite well. However, I think it should be better on the first aspect, which is maybe the more important one for a car that is also often driven in the cities. So, to me, the suspension would be a little bit too stiff for a normal city car, um, since the S-Design is not 
you know, not a Golf GTI or something like that. It's rather a design thingy. So suspension could be a little bit better adapting to the small potholes on the ground. Uh, with the easy steering and the automatic gearbox, and well, when you have the naturally aspirated engine, rather on low RPM, it also feels quite smooth. So then it's also rather relaxing to drive it. Mm. If you imagine a standard compact car, that would actually be it, you know, that maybe you said this is a standard and everything above that is good, everything below that is bad, something like that. Um, that's somehow my driving uh, impression. Again, suspension would be a negative point. Um, the seats, I've mentioned it earlier, especially when, I, when I've driven a little bit longer this vehicle, I found the seats from the core below a little bit too stiff as well. So I would like to have a little bit more, you know, a little bit softer cushion, cushion there. That would be, uh, that would be also suitable for a little bit more comfort. Now we're getting to a little, well, what happened there? A little higher speeds again, and I can also show you some acceleration, maybe those, you know, mid-term accelerations. What happens when I'm going 50 to 70 and really floor it? So you see, it's not happening so much. There's also not any sport mode or something. Um, what you can do, you can put it to manual and then put the gears manual down or up with a big automatic stick. Well, what would you use it for? Usually you would use it when you have, want to use the engine brake, when you know you're on top of a mountain and drive down a very long time, then it actually would make sense. Since we have no side mirror assistance system support here in this very vehicle, I've also set my mirrors a little bit more outward that I really don't miss anything. That's maybe also a tip, especially for the cars that do not have the assistance systems. So, but in general, I feel quite good in the flowing traffic here. So we get along quite easily. So that's also one main characteristic of this car. It is basically easy to learn, easy to drive, easy to steer. Mm, shifting here with the automatic gearbox is also super easy and comfortable then. Uh, what is also good is that they do not use any of those, you know, stair-like automatic trend, that they are like rear gear is here and D is like uh, like a labyrinth in there. You just go front and back from shifting to R and N and D. And that's also handy when you're you know, easing your car in and out to a basement garage, for example. You can just move to the front, R again, just back again, even without pushing the button on the gear, shifting lever, pushing it back to D again, then you're perfectly fine. What we do have as an assistance system is the ACC, that one can be all with this vehicle, and let's accelerate a little bit higher, and well, the high acceleration is where all of this car is struggling, 11.2 seconds to 100 kilometers an hour, or 62 miles an hour is the acceleration figure. Here on the steering wheel, I can, by the way, also set a normal cruise control. Is both possible? Uh, hardly I've seen that with vehicles that have the ACC optional mounted that still keep the normal cruise control. But here it's possible to keep the normal cruise control and the ACC. And so with the ACC, distance to the car in front of me is being kept. That was quite well done. The only thing I'm not so agreeing with when the car is really reducing speed, the ACC seems to have a minimum speed here. So I think it was about 30 or something. And then it does not continue braking process until zero. At some point it stopped. And I don't like that. So either you should be able to trust in the system completely or not, and then just use a normal cross control. So I, I don't really agree to that, how that was laid out here. Maybe we can also get to another situation where this one will be happening, I can show to you again. Other than that, with 100 kilometers an hour, the noise insulation is still quite okay, and it's basically happy cruising, also on the motorway. 
especially with the ACC on. And again, you have to remind again the price of the vehicle. So, of course, there have been a lot of vehicles that also performed better in the driving part. But then again, no, not everyone wants to spend so much money on a car. And if you think about, yeah, do I really want to pay 15,000 euros more just that the car is a little bit more silent? Well, maybe someone says, yeah, of course, that's really useful to me and that drives so much and I have the money, it's no problem. But someone else may be saying, oh, you know, I'd rather save the 15,000 euros and buy something else from it or save it or whatever. So it's totally up to you. That's always important then to access the uh, results in the test according to the price of the vehicle also, because every, you know, a lot, lot of manufacturers can build great cars and sell it for 1,000 euros. The real trick is to build affordable cars and still make them good. That's the thing, the, you know, the key for a really great manufacturer. So we are steadily heading through the countryside sun has come out you know, a little bit too, I like that. And the thing is, the naturally aspirated engine with the automatic gearbox really makes you drive also a little bit more relaxed. It's maybe also one thing, especially in this combination here. It surely will be different with the turbo and manual. Consumption is just above 7 liters on 100 kilometers. If you want to know how much MPG that is, you can just type it in your browser for the recalculation. 7 liters slash 100 km in MPG and then it will tell you. So this should be lower. Now we've had several petrol engine cars which had too much, too much consumption but you know, 110 horsepower and this consumption. And I didn't really drive aggressive to, to score that one. I always try to make it, you know, realistic in a way that, you know, not driving too slow, but also to show you when you drive relaxed, what consumption figure can you reach? And that's it, about seven liters. This car is still somewhat fresh. All of the cars we're testing are relatively fresh. It is also said that after a while, cars, I mean, you know, the engines probably run in, consume a little bit less than it might be. But the good thing is that we can compare quite well because all the cars we're testing are new. Of course, it always depends on the road situations and stuff. Mm, the automatic gearbox can, by the way, sometimes be a little bit irritating when you're in a corner. For example, you're accelerating in a corner with about you know, 20 kilometers an hour, get a little bit off the gas and fastly on the gas again, and then whoop, misses just for half a second and say, yeah, what's he doing? So you have to be aware of that, plan it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But again, when you're driving a little bit calmer, then this is again, no problem. And here also on the countryside route, I can set the ACC again and basically relax. And one interesting thing is also that in the previous review of the Fiat Tipo with, uh, with one of our Thomas, you know, remember we have basically three Thomas in the team, um, the car actually performed a little worse. Um, and that might have something to do with maybe the hatch is really a little bit better than the sedan. I don't know. Basically they're the same platform. Or that they may be improved some minor things on the vehicle throughout time. You can just uh, stress it again also while driving the vehicle. So there is definitely a development that this one here is um, also a little bit better than in the uh, in a previous test we had with this car. Yeah, so to sum it up for you from the driving, basically a standard compact car, interesting price. Mm, very light steering with those two settings you do have available. I would like the suspension not to be that rough on the bumps and the seats should also be a little bit softer to offer more driving comfort because engine, transmission setup wise, it's rather making you drive relaxing and then those other components would also apply for this. So those are two, my two cents or my, my 50 cents, yo. And now to the conclusion for today from the Fiat Tipo. Well, actually the most attractive part about this car 
is first of all the price because it is really very low if you compare it to the competitors. And then you can also say that it's quite okay that it's not the best in the segment for the different features we have tested. However, especially now here today in the S-Design version, I think the design, they've really stepped up the game. I mean, it's a modern, sporty looking hatch, isn't it? Especially here also with the metropolitan gray color with the black alloys. So I think design-wise, they really have that well done. Also, the interior concept is design-wise pretty well done. Um, you know, some details definitely lack the execution still. However, it has been improved if you compare predecessor cars, for example. And the seats should be a little bit more comfortable, definitely, from the soft core. Driving-wise, also the suspension should be a little bit more comfortable for the small potholes. The uh, engine transmission setup is basically okay with me if you drive it relaxed nothing if you want to drive really sporty and so what do you think of course i'm looking forward to your comments put them below our video let's discuss this vehicle and also join us next time thank you so much for watching